Hey guys, in this video the lovely Tim is going to be talking to you about attachment and what attachment is. Now there are lots of facts and studies that you need to remember for this video. So over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting to get you started. Attachment can be defined as this. A strong emotional relationship and bond between an infant and their caregiver. Secure attachment is a social norm. It's the expected behavior of and the relationship between infants and caregivers in our culture and our time period. Caregiver is a loose term and we often use the term primary caregiver. This can vary from infant to infant as to who it actually is and it can vary from circumstances to, to circumstances. Both historically and currently at the present time, however, the primary caregiver of any given infant is most likely to be the biological mother. Obviously, however, this won't always be the case. It can be fathers, it can be siblings, it can be grandparents, aunts, uncles. There's a wide range of people who can be the primary caregiver of an infant. It's not a good idea, especially in an exam, to take primary caregiver as always being biological mother. However, a securely attached infant will show several key behaviours. Number one, they show a strong desire to be physically close to their caregiver. They want to actually be near them. Number two, they show distress, anger or confusion when they're separated from this caregiver. When the caregiver is removed from the child or when the child is removed from the caregiver, that has a negative effect on the infant. And thirdly, they show pleasure, happiness or relief when they're reunited after being separated. When the child is returned to its mother or when the mother is returned to the child. But obviously remember that the primary caregiver won't always be the biological mother and can be a range of people. As you may expect, every relationship between each individual infant and each individual caregiver will be slightly different. There are always individual differences from person to person. But as we saw with social influence, not everyone will always conform to expected social norms. They're norms, not hard and fast rules, and individuals will differ to them. But there are several trends. There are several commonly seen behaviours in these infant caregiver reactions and interactions. These behaviours are thought to be part of creating and maintaining this secure attachment, this normal, healthy relationship between an infant and their caregiver. The first of these is called sensitive responsiveness. This means that the caregiver responds in expected ways to the emotional and physical signals of the infant. For example, expressing sympathy if the infant is distressed smiling if the infant is laughing, etc. The second of these behaviours is imitation. We would expect an infant to imitate and expect to copy the actions and behaviours and movements of their caregiver, such as, for example, trying to copy the facial expressions of parents as they see them making them. A third behaviour that we would expect to see is called interactional synchrony. What we mean by this is that infants react in a short expected time frame to the speech and actions of their caregiver, resulting in a back and forth dance of speech and expressions between the infant and that caregiver. A fourth expected behaviour is reciprocity. Interactions between the infant and the caregiver are out one-sided. They both take an active part in the interaction and they respond to each other. They respond to the language and facial signals used by each other. And the fifth is commonly termed mother ease. This is the slow, tonal, melodic way that we often speak to babies, infants, pets and animals. It's a way of communicating with them in a way that we feel they will understand. And it's an important expected behaviour in how caregivers interact with infants. In 1964, Schaefer identified four stages in the formation of this attachment, and this has come to be a standard model in how we look at how attachment is formed. It's a basis from which we can work. These stages are distinct. They represent steps along a path to an infant forming an attachment with a caregiver. They're not completely set in stone, and when they occur is not set in stone. There are overlaps between the time periods of each of these phases. They don't precisely line up, and there may be variable points at which we can say an individual infant has gone from phase one to phase two, or phase three to phase four. They're not set in stone, and they are a general model. The first of these four stages is called pre-attachment. Sometimes it's also known as the asocial phase. Usually this is between birth and about three months or 12 weeks old. In this time period, the baby learns to discriminate between inanimate objects, tables, carpet, sun, and actual people, other humans. 
However, that said, the baby is completely unable to discriminate between individuals. Therefore, the baby shows no strong preferences for any given one individual. To them, all humans are the same. They all seem alike. Therefore, we can say that the baby isn't yet forming attachments or interacting socially to any significant degree. They're asocial or they're before or pre-attachment. The second of the four phases that Schaefer identified is called the indiscriminate phase. Sometimes it's known as the indiscriminate attachment or diffuse attachment phase. This is usually between six weeks and seven months old, so it's a much longer time period than the first pre-attachment stage. In this phase, the baby learns to discriminate between different people. It can start to tell the difference between mother and father. It can tell differences between two humans. The baby also starts to show some outward signs of recognising some people and not others. An example might be smiling at or responding to parents, but not to a stranger. So the baby can discriminate between people it knows and people that it doesn't know. However, that said, the baby still shows no strong preferences for individuals and doesn't appear to be particularly attached to any single individual. It might smile at parents, but it hasn't yet formed a full attachment. There's no strong preferences being displayed. The third of the four phases that Schaefer identified is called the discriminate attachment phase. Sometimes it's known as the single attachment phase. Usually this is from about seven months old to 11 months old. So again, quite a long time period. During this phase, the baby can discriminate between different individuals. It can tell the difference between mother and father, or mother and grandparent. It can tell the difference between two different people. And it starts to show a strong preference towards a single individual. As we've already discussed at the start of this video, this is usually the biological mother, but not always, and it can be other individuals. There are any number of ways that the baby might show this strong preference for a single individual. It might be distress when that individual is removed or when the baby is removed from that individual. Or it might be happiness when the two are reunited. It can vary from baby to baby. The baby may also show fear or distress in the presence of strangers because the baby can now discriminate between strangers that it doesn't know and other people that it does. And the last and fourth phase is called the multiple attachment phase. And this is open-ended. It's from nine months and upwards. In this phase, as you may expect from the name, the baby is able to form multiple attachments to multiple different people. It can form several attachments to several different close family members, for example. These attachments may vary in both function and in magnitude, in what they're for and how big they are. Some of them will be stronger than others. Some will be weaker. Some will be for play, some will be for food, some will be for protection, for example. They will vary wildly from attachment to attachment. As far as we can tell, there doesn't seem to be an upper limit on the number of attachments a baby can make. But most babies of around 18 months, a year and a half, have at least several. The initial attachment from the single attachment phase will remain strongest. It will remain by far the strongest attachment that the baby has made. In developing and corroborating this four-phase theory of attachment, Schaefer and Emerson in 1964 devised this piece of research. A total of 60 babies were observed, observed in their homes, so actually in a real-life setting rather than being in a laboratory. All of these babies shared similar characteristics. They were all from Glasgow. In 1964, Glasgow was an industrialised, working-class city. Every four weeks, the babies were observed. This was from birth to about 18 months old, so therefore it was for about 18 times. The interactions, behaviour, emotions, expressions of the babies were recorded and observed. In addition to this, some interviews were conducted with the immediate families and therefore usually the primary caregiver of each one of these 60 Glaswegian babies. Schaefer found that the stages of attachment formation occurred roughly as expected. It fitted in with the four phases that had been identified. By the time they were about eight months old, 85% of the babies had at least more than one attachment. Many had several more than that. However, about one third, 33% of the babies, had no strong attachment at all or had no strong attachment with their biological mother. They hadn't formed that socially normal, secure attachment to their biological mother. In these scenarios for that one third of the babies, the biological mother was always the main carer. They were usually the primary caregiver, but the baby hadn't formed a strong, secure attachment to them. And Schaefer began to wonder why and look further into this. There are several conclusions that can be drawn from this research on Glaswegian babies in 1964. Firstly, 
Schaefer concluded that infants form attachments gradually and in defined stages that fitted that four-stage model that we've already seen. And indeed, this research is one of the things that led to it being further developed and published. The second conclusion, however, was that infants can form several attachments to a range of people. But critically, this can only happen once they reach that fourth and final stage, known as the multiple attachment phase. At that point, they can form a range of attachments rather than just a single important one. An observed influence on attachment was the quality of care being provided, how well their physical and emotional needs were being met. As you may expect, infants responded much better to, and therefore formed more secure attachment to, the individuals who responded best to their emotional and outward physical signals. By that, we can therefore mean the individuals who responded best to their needs, who cared for them with the highest quality. This research was done in the real world in 1964 in Glasgow. It was an actual real-world study on actual babies, and 60 of them, so a reasonably decent sample size. It therefore has a good level of ecological validity. It applies in the real world because the study was done in the real world. And even though 60 seems like a reasonable sample size and was for the time, compared to the whole world, it's a relatively small sample size. If you were to repeat and scale this research to many more infants, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, you would get much more concrete results that you could get much more repeatable, scalable conclusions from and that might be generalizable to a wider population. This research was qualitative rather than quantitative. The results wasn't data or statistics that could be fed into graphs and charts to draw conclusions. Because of this, establishing a secure cause and effect relationship wasn't really possible. You can only identify general trends and the information that you've got is open to question and debate rather than being undisputable data. Another problem with this research is that all of the infants were from Glasgow in 1964. They were all from similar cultural backgrounds and similar socioeconomic backgrounds by which we mean how wealthy their families were. Infants from other countries and other cultures may differ strongly to these babies from Glasgow. Something that we haven't talked about very much yet is the role of fathers in attachment and how the role of fathers can vary and how important it is in the development of children and infants. In Schaefer and Emerson's 1964 research, they found that the infants formed a secure attachment with their mother only about half, 50% of the time. For the remaining half, most formed this secure attachment with their father. A few preferred grandparents, uncles, aunts or other family members, but mostly it was the father. A lot of research has therefore been done to establish the role of mothers in attachment, but much less research has been done between 1945 and 1980 on the role of fathers. Between 1945 and 1980, the role of women in families was quite set in stone. It was a social and political norm that they were the primary caregiver. The role of fathers in this social construct was much more to be the breadwinner, to go out, have a career and bring back more money. After 1980, this began to change. And since then, several studies have been done that have looked more closely at the role of fathers and how they interact with attachment and infants. In 2009, Goodsell and Meldrum found that infants with a secure attachment to their mother are likely to also have a similar attachment to their father. In that multiple attachment phase, they're forming two strong secure attachment, one to their mother and one to their father. A range of studies between 1975 and 2004 suggested that the strength of attachment between an infant and their father depends on the level, the quality and the quantity of care that that father provides. We can summarise this by saying that the quality and strength of attachment between an infant and their father depends on how involved the father is with that baby. One study even suggested that fathers who change more nappies are rewarded with a stronger attachment from the infant. Geiger in, in 1996 found that the attachment form between infant and father was of a different function from that of infant and mother. The father was generally seen for play, while the mother was for care and nurture, and at least in a very early stage, food.